today is a feast of Epiphany, and it's a little bit, I always think of uh, three particular people on the feast of Epiphany, and I've mentioned probably them before, but one of them is this, um, re- honest to God, he was a saint. His name was Willie, uh, and Willie lived in Idle Falls, and I told you about him before, but I want to use him again. Um, Willie was Rommel's tank driver. I mean, pretty amazing. And um, after World War II, you, the U.S. shipped him back to the United States. He couldn't stay in Germany. And he ends up uh, outside of Idaho Falls. He falls in love with this um, German Catholic, uh, Elsie. And Elsie changed his world because he admits that he was a Nazi. Um, but it, of course he says, you know, he was a 17 year old. What, what does a 17 year old know? And he meets Elsie and Elsie was a, Elsie was a saint, a woman of incredible love, very devout Catholic. And, uh, Elsie was his star that changed the course of his life. And really by the time I met, um, Willie, he was this incredible mother Teresa of, um, Idle Falls. He did tons of work only because he was carrying on Elsie um, and I did Elsie's funeral but he was honestly got a saint and the amazing part is like he'd go to mass uh, he wasn't Catholic but he'd go to mass just to pray for Elsie and also in the same parish there's Willie and then there's Madame uh, Suzanne Madame Madame Suzanne Fonsbeck who was another saint um, and she was in the French resistance and like, it just amazed me that they would sit together in the same pew when they would have killed each other before that. Um, but my only point being is that love will take you on a journey you, in ways you've never expected. And for Willie, Elsie was his star, where he ended up really at the manger, worshiping Christ. And why I want to use this story again is... In the past, I tried to explain what the Magi were. The Magi were really the people outside religion that they'll end up worshiping Christ too. God will send them a star. For Willie, the star was Elsie. I've explained what the Magi are. Uh, That's horrible. Uh, I've explained what the star is, but you know, I've never really explained the symbols of the gifts, of the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And Willie offered a gift to God as well um, of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, in this sense. Um, so what the gifts symbolize, and the gifts are twofold. The gifts speak about the nature of Christ, but they also speak about our nature. So the gold, the gold is pretty obvious, and the gold obviously is a sign that you give a king, right? Pretty obvious, but what you may not know is that Magi in Persia, in ancient Persia, the Magi were part of the enthronement for the king that the Magi had to offer their blessing for a Persian king to take throne. So the fact that these astrologers, and that's what the Magi were, astrologers, they come to Judah to uh, really enthrone the new king of the Jews. But remember, they're Persians, they're non-Jews. Um, so he's also being uh, named king of all us Gentiles as well. That's why Herod gets so upset. Herod wasn't really even Jewish. So to have somebody named king of the Jews, he's going to feel threatened. And the gold, um, pretty obvious, symbolizes his kingship. He's king of the Jews, but also king of us Gentiles as well. But the gold, if you're a king and I give you gold, If you're the king, then my life is spent in service of the king. And the gold symbolizes that part of us that is just majestic, that serves the king. And Willie, back to Willie, Willie offered gold. And the gold, by the way, it's supposed to be part of our soul. Uh, That's what we're offering. And Willie offered this gold in the sense of, look at how he served the king. Willie... um, Elsie died of Alzheimer's. So Willie would bring donuts to the Alzheimer's units at the nursing home. And Willie, he was a big, huge giant of a German man. Even in his 80s, he looked formidable. Um, he was like, well, from my perspective, 6'8". <laughs> but he was huge. 
And still, like, I know this sounds strange, but it says this in the Bible. God knits us together in our mother's soul, and God makes some of us simply more powerful. And Willie was just born powerful. And he spent, after he met Elsie, he spends his life not attacking people, but defending the weak. He would, he knew he was formidable. So he'd bring donuts to the nurses in the uh, Alzheimer's units just to make sure all the Alzheimer's units and nursing homes that they were being treated well. He defended the migrants. He served the poor. Um, he did a huge amount of work. Even like um, he would get up in the middle of the night and go to the bus station when the buses would come into the Idaho Falls just to make sure there was no, nobody homeless. And if they needed a ride into town or a place to stay, Willie would take care of them. He was a saint. And his service to the king was that he, yeah, he was built powerful. And he defended those who are weak and on the margins. Um, that was the gold of his soul that he offered. And each of us, God knits us together in the mother's, our mother's womb. We have gold that we can offer the king. Does that make sense? That's what you're supposed to offer God. Or the frankincense. The frankincense, it's actually this resin, this um, uh, what you get from trees, so it's sap. But it's a perfume. And if you know their Bible well, you take it's in the Bible. You take the frankincense, and it's used in the ordination of priests. Um, so it's this perfumey thing you put in the olive oil when priests are ordained in the line of Aaron. And we still do it today. When a priest is ordained, he's uh, not only anointed, he's anointed with this perfumey olive oil. And... Um, it's, so it's used in the ordination of priests, and the idea is that if the uh, Magi are offering it to Christ, they're not only proclaiming him king, but high priest. And he'll be starting a new line of priesthood, not based on Aaron, the Levites, but Christ. Um, frankincense was also used in um, uh, meal sacrifices in Judaism. So if you're going to offer God bread and wine, you would put frankincense into it because uh, it speaks about the divine. So the frankincense, it's our holiness. It's our prayer life. And yes, I, I mean, I really try and think people should be praying twice a day. But it's our prayer life. And Willie, God bless him, loved him. He wasn't that great on prayer. He would show up to daily mass. But that's what we offer God is this prayer life back to him. Um, that's what we offer Christ. So the frankincense symbolizes our prayer life. The myrrh, um, I have to admit, that's my favorite of all. Myrrh is a great symbol. Myrrh comes from this uh, thorn bush, and that's important to know. It comes from this thorn bush, and from our oldest records in like Paleolithic times, oddly enough, Human beings always use myrrh when it came to funeral rites. Myrrh, isn't that just bizarre? Um, and the Jews did it as well. Um, so, like Christ uh, on the cross, they give him wine mixed with myrrh because myrrh was uh, associated with death, but also it was all, it's still used today in the Middle East as a painkiller. Um, he, he doesn't take it. And then the ancient Jewish... Uh, ritual is that when you die, your, uh, your dead body is anointed with myrrh and aloe. And myrrh is always associated with death. So the most bizarre gift of all is obviously the myrrh. That would be like if somebody's going to uh, throw a baby shower and your gift is going to be a little tiny coffin. Like that would be just... Uh, that's a bizarre gift, or it'd be, I guess, more embalming uh, fluid. Like, why would you offer a baby that? But it's going to be a life of sacrifice, and it speaks about his death. And by the way, I just got carried away. Um, the myrrh, I, the reason why I mentioned the thorn thing is um, myrrh was grown on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is where Mount Zion is, the temple is. And the first sacrifice that happens in the Bible is Abraham's sacrifice. And remember, 
the, the sheep has his head caught in a thorn. It's myrrh. The Mount Moriah and myrrh are uh, related words. So Mount Moriah, where the temple was, that's where myrrh grew. And the sheep has his head caught in it, and Christ has this crown of thorns. Does that make sense? He's also the true sacrifice. But the myrrh, why it's my favorite is um, I do want my life to be poured out in service for other people. And I know this sounds strange, but I do want to be a martyr. I would love to die a martyr, to offer my life uh, for God. Unfortunately, it'll probably be my staff that kills me because I am very difficult to work with. But do you remember, um, do you remember uh, the Sandy Hook killing where, um, horrible thing, but I love this story, this one teacher, when a kid was about to be killed, the teacher runs over and grabs and uh, huddles and holds the child. The teacher dies. And the mother, she's crying, and she says, I, I'm so grateful that out of the last thing was my daughter feeling love that the teacher gave her life for my daughter. Why wouldn't I want to die a martyr for my king? Um, why not pour out my complete life? The myrrh symbolizes a life of sacrifice. I would love that. So the point of the three gifts is that they speak about Christ, but they also speak about us, each of us in our own way. We're supposed to offer Christ gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, what our soul is made out of. Each of us different, but they all contain gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so, think about this. And this is what I, my point is. The definition of a magi is somebody who is a gift bearer. Somebody who offers a gift. And tonight, we play the role of the magi. And the word Eucharist, in case you didn't know the Greek, Eucharist means good offering. So, colloquially, it means Thanksgiving. But technically, like any word that starts with E-U, like you. Eulogy, that just means good word. E-U is uh, good in Greek. So Eucharist is a good offering. Uh, we're supposed to be this Eucharistic people that, yes, we make a good offering to God. Our whole life is offering gifts to God. Um, we pray in the Eucharistic prayer that our lives will be an et a, uh, eternal gift to God. We pray for that. What I don't understand, and I really have problems with, is people that call themselves Christian, but they offer no gifts. They worship Christ because all they want to do is take, give me, give me, give me, give me. And even like, sounds awful, my mother has this very funny friends of hers who asked her this strange question. They said, well, do you think when we die, we could be buried in the Catholic Church? And my mother said, well, why wouldn't you be buried in the Catholic Church? You're Catholic. And the woman says, well, to be honest, we've never been registered in a parish because we don't want to be um, sent envelopes and asked for anything. And what they, my mother found out, and so my mother called me and I said, yes, they would be allowed to be buried, but they've never contributed to the Catholic Church. If they have this huge home, he drives a Jaguar, she drives a Lexus, and I said, Mother, have they ever done anything for anybody else? Have they ever worked in a food bank or given a Christmas box? And she said, I don't ever remember them doing that. You know, it seems strange to call yourself a Christian when you offer nothing to your king. No gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's like Herod. Herod and the priests in the story, they know exactly where the king is going to be, the Messiah is going to be born. Why didn't the, any of the priests show up? Because they're not magi. They can't offer any gifts. We tonight, our lives are supposed to offer gifts to the king. We're supposed to be like Willie and all a long line of hundreds of thousands of magi who show up to offer the gold and frankincense of our soul. That makes us true magi. So together, let us stand and profess our faith.